So welcome, Guy Raz. Thank welcome you. to the show. I'm so happy Thank you're you for, here. Thank you for having me. I'm really happy you're here. Um, you do so many cool things and they're not just cool. They're like crazy prolific. And I think most people probably know you from how I built this, but you have like a serious background. Like you've been involved <laughs> in some like major points in history. You've sat down with like world leaders. It's like a big old deal career. So can we just go back for a second to like how you started and sure how you kind of became this awesome person that you are. Um, God, I don't know how I, I, I'm worried. I'm not going to fulfill the awesome expectations, <laughs> but I'll do my best. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm one of those kind of weird people that knew I wanted to be a journalist when I was young. And, and what I mean by young is in high school. I was, I was involved in the student newspaper in my high school. Um, and then when I got to college, I did, I did the same thing. I um, mean, really my dream was to be um, a reporter, a foreign correspondent. I, I spent a year abroad in college in, in, and um, I got a chance to travel through Eastern Europe in the early 90s when it was still like post-Soviet. And I was so intrigued. I wanted to go back to that part of the world. Um, but after college, I couldn't get a job as a newspaper writer anywhere. It was really hard. I mean, these were the most coveted. It's hard to believe now. And, but in the 90s, if you want to be a journalist, you'd go to a newspaper and try to get a job at like the Baltimore Sun or the Dallas Morning News or the Chicago Tribune was so hard. I mean, they, you know, they plucked like Harvard and Yale and Princeton graduates. I mean, as I say, it's hard to believe now because, you know, those papers are a shadow of, a of their former heart. selves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I couldn't, I couldn't get an internship or anything there. And I, I ended up landing an internship at NPR which is not a, a place I grew up listening to. My parents didn't, they listened to commercial radio when I was a kid. I wasn't strapped into a car seat listening to NPR. In fact, when I was a baby, there were no car seats. I mean, there were no car seat laws. So I was just, I was lying in the back of the station wagon like a sardine while they were <laughs> winding through the, the freeways of Southern California. Um, but they listened to commercial radio. And when, when I got this internship at NPR, uh, my parents were like, what, what is it? It's a radio station? What, what are you gonna do there? Um, and I ended up going there. I, I actually discovered it in college, just like just like twisting the dial. And, and, and I heard car talk and I was like, what is this? Who are these people? This is so funny. <laughs> and that's how I, I, I ended up really becoming attracted to NPR. And I went and worked there as an intern. And that was really the beginning. I mean, I, I wanted to be a reporter. It was my dream. And I was really passionate about it. I was really committed to it. I was so naive that I would tell people like, I want to be a foreign correspondent here one day. Like I would be, I would tell other interns you. and they would look at me like, like, who, who are you? Like, do you really think that's going to happen? And I, I was so, I remember having a conversation with a, with a colleague and another, another intern, like in, this is in like the late nineties. And I was like, she was like, what do you want to do here? And I was like, I want to be foreign correspondent. And she was like, good luck. That never happens. And I, and I was like, wow, I, I, maybe, maybe it won't happen. Um, but I got a lucky break, which was um, I, I started to write for the Washington city paper when I was an intern. And this is in the late nineties when alternative weeklies were really important. And this was a newspaper at the time that really was, was punching above its weight in Washington, DC. It was breaking stories. It was, it was the counter countercultural paper to the Washington post. It also happened to be edited by David Carr, who would go on to become the, you know, David Carr. And, and his writers were like Jake Tapper, who's on CNN, and ta Coates, like one of the greatest writers in America, um, and other really great writers. And I got a chance to be a writer there. Um, and, and that was really the beginning of my career and how I kind of got into professional journalism. And really, once I, once I started to write articles and to get bylines and people would notice them, it became easier for me to get other jobs and to pitch other places. And then eventually to pitch my own organization, NPR, um, where I started to report and, and then eventually set off on a, on a seven year career as a foreign correspondent covering wars and conflicts, which a lot of people, when they hear that today, when they, you know, they're like, Oh, how I built this, you're the, how I built this guy. And, and they're like, you don't, you don't do war. Like, what's that? But that's what I did for like a big, big part of my early career. I know. And that's why I wanted to talk about it. Cause yeah, people don't know. They think of you as like this super cool friends with everybody in pop culture. No, and you are, and you Not did some, cool. you, you are cool. You have the <laughs> Seth Godin cool factor. It's like, you can't not be cool. He's cool. He's pretty cool. Yeah. The thing is, um, that's a really serious, uh, potentially, uh, 
traumatic thing to live through uh, and you handled it with a lot of grace. What was that like? I mean, you were, why don't you talk a little bit about where yeah. you were? I mean, I know a little bit about you being in Jerusalem and yeah. that wasn't an easy time to be there. How did you deal with that? You know, I really kind of fell into war reporting. I mean, I, I started out, I was sent to, my my first um, overseas posting was to Berlin and, um, and I did not belong there. I did not belong I, I, I was no reason why I was 25. I was sent overseas oh to be NPR's God. correspondent in Germany. You know, this is just a different time. I mean, I, I think at the time, if you were an ambitious reporter, you wanted to be overseas, you would go to a newspaper. You wouldn't, you wouldn't apply to NPR. I mean, as crazy as that sounds. Um, and so I, I got this job. I, I had um, some German and um, I had some experience as a domestic reporter, but I think the editor who hired me really just wanted somebody who was just going to work their butt off for him. <laughs> you know, he was just like, go and don't ask questions and just say yes. And so I went and, you know, initially I was supposed to just kind of cover post-Soviet, these post-Soviet countries. But um, pretty soon after I got there, there was a conflict in Macedonia and in, another flare up in Kosovo. And so I started going there and I had no experience at all. I mean, I, 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 the first time I went to war zone, I didn't come with a flak jacket or any, anything. I had no knowledge of, of what it meant. I was just like, okay, I'm going to go and figure oh, it out. God. And, and, um, you know, I literally remember going to this village in Macedonia, it was called Tetovo. And there were, there was basically the Macedonian army was, um, was like, um, firing mortars fire at the hillside where there were rebels in the hillside firing mortars back and, and gunshots back onto the village. And I had, I was so naive. I just went into the village and it's like, Hey, anybody want to get on mic? And there was no one in the streets, you know? And one of the, one of the earliest things I remember was really like a weekend. Um, I'm with my, this driver I found who kind of spoke some English, who's was kind of doubling as my translator until I found one. His name was Tony. He was a great guy. Um, and uh, he, he was like this you know, barrel chested guy. And uh, he had, he, we were walking through this village and I was like, I got to find people to interview. And all of a sudden I hear this, you know, by my ear. And I, and he's like, get down. It turns around. There's, there's like a bullet hole, like a, a, a fresh bullet hole in the wall. Like I was that naive. What? So that was, that was sort of my first exposure to covering conflicts. And then from there, you know, it, it 9-11 happened, um, you know, in, in a year later after I got there and, most media organizations just kind of flooded the zone. It was like Afghanistan. It was the Middle East. It was Iraq. And then that began like a, you know, sort of four years of me or five years really of me going in and out of Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, and then, uh, you know, and then eventually becoming the correspondent for CNN in, in Jerusalem, covering Israel and Palestine, spending time in Gaza on the West Bank. Um, and so I kind of fell into it. I was not I was, this was not my life's dream. I did not wake up and say, I want to be a war correspondent. Um, and, and I, I, I'm not sort of naturally, um, I would say, uh, I, I don't have the natural kind of personality of a person who, who's like, a, I'm not an adrenaline junkie. Like I didn't want to go to those places to see gun, gunshots and explosions and join them, you know, military reconnaissance units and, and go on missions and ambushes and whatever, whatever. I was not me, but I ended up doing that. And it, it's just interesting. And, and I think strange how you adapt, you know, you, you, you are a reporter, you become the reporter you have to be and you're out in the world. And, and so over that time, um, wow. I saw some incredible things, you know, I, and, and was able to um, see some tragic and horrendous things as well. But um you know, it was a time in my life that it's, it's not that long ago, 15 years ago, really, 14 years ago, but um, it feels very far away, very distant mm. from, from, from my life now. But mm -hmm. an incredible, rich experience that I would never trade for anything in the world. Yeah, it's amazing. I actually went to Jerusalem on a three-week trip after college and stayed for three years. And I was there, I was in Sabaro the day that Sabaro blew up. And I was like a kid from California, like knew nothing about yeah. wars or suicide bombings. And I was there yeah. for three years and um, actually went back again in 2005, 2006 during Gush Katif and all of that stuff. And, um, and then I came back to LA and do what I do. And I can only imagine, cause it's like Chal Homer, as they say in Hebrew, like 10 times what I lived, you were living cause you were in the eye of it. But I think it gave you, I'm guessing, a tremendous amount of um, strength. And because you've sat down with some of the most powerful people in the world, and you're like, 
just just as cool as a cucumber. And I guess, <laughs> I don't know if you feel like having been so young and put in such a difficult, stressful um, mission, like has made you who you are. I think what's, what, what it's, what it has made me is more empathetic. Um, yeah. You know, I, I covering, covering conflict zones. Um, I was never that interested in like battle tactics or strategy or, you know, this explosion or body counts. It's not, that's not what I was interested in. I I was interested in human beings who live in those conflict zones and how they're impacted by them. And I got to meet incredible people. I mean, if you want to meet the most generous and the kindest people on the planet, go to a village in Afghanistan where, where, you know, where people have lost everything, go to any, any conflict zone that you can imagine in the world. It's, it's usually incredibly poor people who are just trying to protect their families and who are kind and who will, you know, will greet you and will welcome you and will give you everything they have to feed you. I mean, I I mean, I, I remember, you know, going to a village in Afghanistan in a rural, remote, I mean, the whole country's remote, but very remote part of Afghanistan in the north. And, you know, they like slaughtered a goat for me in my honor and they had nothing. So I think really what it taught me was mm. to, it, it taught me most importantly to listen, you know, just to listen to people. People just want to be heard. Um, and uh, at the very basic level, people just want to be heard. And that I think helped me to learn how to, to do that, to just listen to people and, and acknowledge their stories. You are so good at that. I think that's why people are so good on your show because they feel you make such a space and they really, when people feel there's a space, they, they talk differently, they come alive, you know? And I love that we went down this road because I was like, am I going to ask him about this? But what you just said is so powerful, um, so beautiful. So. You, you do like six other things, um, but I want to talk about how I built this because I, I don't want to keep you forever. And I want to talk about the show and the book. How on earth did you pivot from that to doing how I built this? Like how, how does, how do you make yeah. a transition like that? I mean, I think that with and everything in my career, it just kind of happened organically. Like I don't, I don't think strategically, like, what am I going to do tomorrow? I, right. I mean, admittedly, I do, I do a little bit more of that now, you know, just like, what, well, what else could I do? What other shows could I do? But they're never, they're never like, they never come out of like a boardroom or like a, a, a discussion. It's, it's really just kind of experiencing what I experience and knowing that there's a point in my life where I have to change something. And, you know, with how I built this, um, I mean, the, the kernel of the idea started out during a, a kind of a low point in my professional career. Well, low point's not, not exactly right, but it started out as a low point. I wanted, it, it, it was about 2007, and I had come back to NPR, and I was covering the Pentagon, and, but I really didn't like that. I didn't want to do that. I, I, I wanted to tell stories. I wanted to interview lots of people. I wanted to actually be a, a host of an NPR news magazine, um, like all things considered. And at the time, there was, um, you know, there there, uh, there was executives who just didn't think that I had what it t- took to be a host of a show, and and was told I was told that I was told that, you know, you don't have the personality or the oh God, famous um, last words. And so that really was the beginning of my time, in my beginning point of my career. And I was still in my thirties, early thirties, where I thought, you know, maybe this isn't meant for me. I did my journalism thing. I had this kind of fast rise and maybe that, that was my downfall. Um, so I, I very luckily, I applied for a bunch of fellowships and I very luckily got one, the Neiman fellowship, which is this year where you can spend at Harvard with other journalists and you can take any class you want. And I spent my year, 2007, 2008, 2009 there, kind of thinking that this is going to be my transition out of journalism. You know, I was going to figure out, well, maybe I'll go work in, I don't know, but I'll go work somewhere else. And that year I took a class at Harvard Business School. And on the first day of class, and I'm expecting like, you know, charts and formulas and abstract concepts. The first day of class, they hand out, um, they, 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 they hand out a document and it's a little packet. And it's a story about the founding of Starbucks. 
and and we take it home and we read it and then and then it ends and it ends at a, on a cliffhanger and it's it's called like case study part a and and i was like what what is this, this is so interesting it was like the story of howard schultz and um and then we had to wait until the next week to find out how he dealt with this crisis and it turns out that's how business school is taught it's taught through stories and i was blown away i, I couldn't believe that business school is primarily taught that way and i thought why why is this only available to people who pay a hundred thousand dollars a year? And I knew that, that one day we could do something like that better, you know, and make it free and make it available to everybody. So that idea was planted in my head. It turns out that some of those executives had left NPR. So the path was cleared for me to actually try and, and host programs. And also that year when I was living in Boston, um, I, I was hosting programs to the local station there. So I came back to NPR and I, I, I eventually was hired to be the weekend host of All Things Considered, um, which I did for several years. But in my mind, that idea was always planted. It, it, it had been planted, that seed. And, you know, long story short, I decided to leave the world of news in 2012. Um, it just wasn't speaking to me. It wasn't, um, I didn't feel like I was fulfilling the mission that I wanted to fulfill in my own life, which was, you know, I, I went into journalism, and I think a lot of people go into it um, to to try and make the world a better place in some small way. And for me, it was how can I, you know, especially when I covered conflict zones, how can I cover these stories and build empath empathy for these people so that other people hearing it on maybe on the other side of this conflict will listen and 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 maybe understand them better and maybe maybe feel more more empathetic um, and maybe it can bring people closer together. Um, I found that the opposite actually was happening, you know, and not, not just because of what I was doing, but because of the way the world was unfolding. Um, and I, and I, so I left the new side of, of NPR in 2012 to start um, a show in collaboration with Ted, the Ted talks people. And that really kind of launched me in, in a completely different direction because that show, I, I wanted to make a show and they gave me free reign. They said, do, do, do whatever you want. I wanted to make a show that was about what it means to be human. So, why are we creative? Why do we collaborate? Why do we grieve? Why do we, um, how do we experience death? How do we experience joy? Just universal experiences of humans. And, but all the while in my head, I had this idea for how I built this, something I wanted to do, you know, and, and, and it's basically the same, a version of the same thing I've been doing my whole career, which is listening to people and telling their stories. But we use business as the prism through which to tell these stories. Because as I, you know, and as I try to explain in the book, every business journey is like a hero's journey. You know, that that's the that's what it what it's like. And I, I love I love reading reading about hero. I love hero's journeys. I loved reading Joseph Campbell in college, who came up with this concept. And that was really the genesis of how I built this, which I launched in 2016, um, you know, as in tandem with with, with what I was doing at the time, which was Ted Radio Hour. So that, that's really how it began. Oh, it's so good. And the name of it's so good. And that Howard Schultz interview that you went on to do is so good. I love that. I learned so much about him that I didn't know from hearing you sit down with what, him. He's a, great, he's a great person and a, a, real, a really kind, good yeah, man. Yeah, we had yeah. him on this show and I cried like half oh, the time. Yeah. He's like, he goes, I've learned with a rabbi every morning for 20 yeah. years. Do you know the yeah. rabbi from the mirror? I was like, are you the same Howard? Like who? Yeah. He's, he's amazing. He's, he is. Um, but back to you being amazing, which you are. Um, what do you feel like for our listeners who want so much to start a business, to be entrepreneurs? Yeah. You, you've sat down with, I mean, the most successful people that, that are around. What are some of the through lines that you think make that hero's journey what it is? What are some of the qualities? Yeah. I mean, um, I mean the first thing is the, the only difference between an entrepreneur and you, uh, not you, but anyone listening or watching is um, they went into the phone booth and put on the cape, right? So the idea is that we're all Clark Kent's, you know, like that's our avatar. And entrepreneurs just make a decision to act on their idea. Um, they're not superheroes. They don't have any mm. incredible skills or gifts that you don't have or can't develop. I mean, of course, there are, you know, you've got your, your sort of geniuses like Toby Ludke, who founded Shopify and literally coded it himself, but he's really an exception. I mean, most of the entrepreneurs I've interviewed, they develop the skills that it takes to be 
successful. I mean, one of the most inc- important, you know, everyone knows that you've got to be resilient and you've got to be optimistic and you've got to have an unshakable belief in your product and you've got to be persistent. Um, the, the, but there are skills that you actually can develop to become an entrepreneur. And the, the key skill that everybody who wants to do this needs to develop is the ability to withstand rejection. The, the ability to hear the answer no again and again and again <laughs> and to keep pushing until you get to a yes. It's very hard. Most of us um, like validation and rejection is the opposite of validation. Most of us don't like to hear people say that's a dumb idea or that will never work. But you know what? Joe Gebbia of Airbnb and Brian Chesky, the, the co-founders of Airbnb, they went to 20, entre- to 20 venture capitalists in 2008 and they said, we want to start this company where people stay on other people's couches in their homes. And th- the response from 20 venture capitalists in 2008 was, that's a dumb idea. Who's going to stay in a stranger's home? <laughs> they, they, they solicited, at that, by the way, in 2008, you could have purchased 10% of Airbnb for $150,000. All, all 20 of the venture capitalists um, said no, they weren't interested. So, you know, it, it takes a lot of persistence, but to, to get there, you've got you've to learn how to deal with rejection. And a lot of the entrepreneurs that have been on the show and that I talk about in the book too, they, um, you know, they started out in sales, door-to-door sales. And they would have doors slammed in their faces like Sarah Blakely of Spanx or Tope Awatana, who started Calendly. He sold, you know, ADT alarm systems door to door. And when you hear a lot of, a lot of no's, you understand that eventually there's a hit rate. You will get, you will get to yeses. You will get people Mm -hmm. to, to invest in your business. You will get people to believe in your idea. Um, And that is the one quality that they all have in common. And most of them learned how to, learned how to, grow that second layer of skin, that thick skin that is the armor that shields them from from hearing no, 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 no all the time. That's so good. I love it. So what what made you decide now is the time to make it into a book? Because you've been doing this for a while. You have amazing episodes, but now is the time. Look, how I built this is like a free MBA. And in fact, I receive a lot of emails and messages from business school professors who use our show to teach business school. Wow. So you are paying 50 to $80,000 a year and you get to listen to how I built this with your business school professor. That's great. I'm honored, (laughs) but we make this show for everybody for free. It's accessible. And really the idea is, and, and, and the way I've seen the show for the last four years is it is like, it is like an MBA for people who can't afford it, who can't go to business school. It really is a show full of wisdom and advice and, and inspiration. And the book is different from the show in that it, 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 it's designed as a kind of a how-to journey for how to build a business and how to think about building a business. And, and it's also designed to inspire people who are, in, you know, who are thinking about it or who are in the, in the thick of it. You know, a lot of people who listen to the show um, have written in over the years to say, you know, I was ready to give up. I just, it, it was so hard. I, I was barely making payroll, um, it was stressful. And I had this background in accounting and I thought I'm just gonna give this up at your show. I heard this episode and, I, and that person's story and how they almost lost everything inspired me to keep going. I just got an email from a guy who, 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 who said that he almost gave up two years ago and now his business is booming. He makes, um, he makes like art, artisanal electric, electric cords and um, like, um, you know, um, electric plug boxes and stuff, beautiful stuff. And their business is just growing exponentially. And he, and he said, you know, I was willing, I was ready to give this up a year and a half ago and, and, and the show kept me going and now we're doing great. So that's why I wrote the book. I wrote the book because I wanted it to be like the thing on your nightstand that, you know, if you're like me, you probably wake up in the middle of night and you could open it up and you, and it's like your cheerleader. It's like, it's like me in your uh, next to your bed going, you got this, keep, keep going. You got this. It's going to be hard. Keep at it. And here's an example of somebody who went through the same exact thing you're going through right now. And here's how they solved it. So it's, it's basically, you know, a narrative arc on how to start a business, but told through the stories of like a hundred people. 
I love getting to meet you and hearing what's so lighting you up about helping other people to find that resilience. And I know you've been doing the How I Built Resilience series, but to really see you come alive when you talk about this, where does that come from? Like when you were a kid, is there something like in your parents and your grandparents, is there something about resilience? Where Because it's when you talk about it, you can feel like that's the imprint you want to make. And that's really pretty beautiful. You know, I... I think there's actually, it actually comes from a place of selfishness, not selflessness. And um, what I mean by that is there is a lot of scientific evidence that when you give, it actually mm-hmm. has an incredible effect and impact on you. I mean, there's a reason why, you know, philanthropists give tons of money away. I mean, on the one hand, they like to see their name on, on, on buildings, um, which, you know, Okay, but really, it's it's about it's about the way it makes them feel too. You know, knowing that they're making an impact, and and I I get a lot out of it. You know, I get a lot out of knowing that the show and the the stories we tell and the work we do is meaningful to people. I mean, it it gives me meaning. You know what I mean? It's so. I, I wish I could say to you, you know, Kathy, this is all because I'm this selfless human being like Mother Teresa and my heart is made of pure gold. It's not that at all. I, I, it's, it's, it's meaning and purpose. We're all looking for that. And for me, knowing that, you know, that what I do actually changes people is, I can't ask for anything more. You know, I can't ask for anything more. It is, it is an incredible feeling to know that I can do that. So that's what motivates it. I love that you are an even better interviewee than when you're interviewing. Like you're, I would just love hearing you speak. It's really, there's so much substance in what you're saying. I heard a story about the Rothschilds that he was asked at like close to the end of his life, what he was worth. You know this story? No. Someone came into his office and like, what are you worth? He was worth so much money. And he, he has his assistant bring over this huge book. It was like a ledger of all the Sadaka, like all the charity he had given. And he was like, this is what I'm worth. You know, it was like what he had given away. Um, But that's so beautiful, the way that you see it. And it's so obvious because you are unrelenting in how much you just continue to give. And it's it's working. It's working. Um, I think right now, if I can just ask this question, people are probably going to want to poke a hole in it and say, but it's COVID. There's no way my business is going to keep going now. So what you got for me now? Um, but you, you know about that. That's not anything new. You've been talking about it. So what's, yeah. your, what's your feedback for people when they believe like they're going to have to close their business or there's no way to start one right now? What do you say about that? Well, let, me, let me start by, by, by addressing the second one, because I actually think that there's a huge opportunity to think about starting a business now. I mean, if you think about some of the most incredible and powerful businesses in the world, like Microsoft or Slack or even Airbnb, FedEx, they were all started during economic downturns and, and, and Slack and Airbnb and Betterment, they were started during a financial crisis, you know, um, when, when investors were not opening up their pocketbooks. The thing is, is that if you start at the bottom, there's really nowhere to go except up if you can survive it. And the reality is, is that starting a business during an economic downturn or crisis forces you to be incredibly efficient and economical with how you start the business, how you spend money, um, what you spend it on. You've got to be extremely cautious with the decisions you make. And, and I actually, you know, we, we talk a lot about entrepreneurship in America and it's very sexy and how I built this is, you know, we, we have these amazing stories, but the reality is entrepreneurship has been in decline in the United States over the past 40 years. And, and the reason, a lot of that has to do, and there are a number of reasons why, a lot of that has to do with health insurance. You know, people have gone hmm. to work for big wow. companies because they want health insurance, which, which go, just tells you how insanely stupid our system is, right? That is really stupid, um, yeah. You know, a lot of people think of Europe as slow and, and the old world. Actually, there's a lot of entrepreneurial spirit in Europe. You know, there are a lot of small businesses in Europe 
because people don't have to worry about things like health insurance. But in the United States, over the last 40 years, more and more people have worked for bigger companies. Well, I actually think that we, you know, we can, we can recapture that spirit of entrepreneurship. You know, we can, we can find a way to go back to that, to that kind of um, energy that, that we once had. And I think, and I think in the midst of this crisis, and the reason why I think it's so important is because entrepreneurship is where innovation comes from. You know, yes, it comes from big companies too. Yes, you know, Intel and Procter and Gamble have, you know, and pharmaceutical companies, but it's the people working in small garages who make huge changes. And when I talk about entrepreneurship, I'm not saying you need to found, you need to, you know, found the next Airbnb or the next Uber. I'm talking about a small business. I'm talking about anything that offers a product or a service that is better than, than what's out there, you know? And, and basically a business is, is solve, it's, it's, a, it's a problem. You are searching for a problem. A business is, the, the question you're asking is, how can I solve this problem for me and other people who have it? And there's your business. I mean, with respect to like, what do I do now? I'm in the middle of COVID, in the middle of a crisis. It's, it's a very t- challenging question to answer, especially if you are in the restaurant industry, especially if you are in an industry that is heavily dependent on human contact, like live events. Um, I've seen some incredible creativity among the people that we've had on the show recently. I mean, obviously restaurants that have, that have really gone into to takeout, um, not totally covering all their costs, but allowing those restaurants to kind of stay alive and afloat to see this out. A lot of big companies have cash, so they're just hoarding cash and, and, and making sure to be very conservative with it. But small businesses that are dependent on cash, they have to think creatively. It's a very hard moment. You know, I, I, even like live events businesses are trying virtual events out or they're trying outdoor events where um, they're, 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 they're being super strict about distancing. I mean, I don't have all the answers. Ultimately the answers are going to come from, from people who run those businesses, but it's a time to be totally radical. You can't, you can't hem and haw and you can't hesitate. You have to do things that you could not imagine doing a year ago. I'll give you one small example. Um, Zumba, it's a big business, but Zumba is a business that depends on its trainers going to gyms Mm -hmm. and those trainers paying a, a monthly fee, subscription fee to Zumba. Well, what do you do when you can't train people? In a matter of four weeks, Zumba set up an online platform for all of its like 20, 30,000 trainers around the world to to basically do exercise classes on their platform. Zumba made it available for free for all these trainers. And by the way, it doesn't take a cut of any of, of these exercise classes. They, they set this up in six weeks. I, the founder of Zumba said, if we wanted to do this last year at a normal time, it would have taken us two years. We would have had meetings. We'd have had marketing calls. There would have been uh, committees. We would have had, you know, uh, we would have product tested. He said, we didn't have time for that. We just had to get it out there. It's imperfect and we're improving it every day, but we had to do it. And it's actually been amazing. And I think I that's that. a, an important lesson for people right now is to, is to get radical, do radical things mm. to keep your, at the very least, to keep your business afloat. To get to get you through this moment and we will be back we will be back so good so inspiring one of the things that um is really sustainable right now is doing things virtually and you having a podcast you know doing something where you have this online platform it's like it's an amazing time to to have already built that um but i'm curious from your standpoint because you've done npr you've done radio you've done print do you like doing a podcast best? Like where, how does a podcast for you stack up? Uh, why would that be something that you like more or less? Like, how do you feel about that particular medium having yeah. a podcast? I mean, I, I, you know, I started out in radio and as you say, I've, I've, I've written print articles and have, have done that. Um, and I was in television at one point in my career. Um, and now I run my own production company and I've got a few different podcasts. Um, you know, the beauty of, of digital audio podcasting is 
um, you know, there's no limits. I mean, you can go as long as you want. Uh, I, I don't recommend it. I don't think that's actually always <laughs> a great, great thing. I think that editing is really important. But I mean, you can, you know, the rules are kind of out the window. The parameters that you have when you're on terrestrial radio are completely different. And so, and also, I, you know, I feel like it's a really intimate, it's just an incredibly intimate medium. I mean, I, um, you know, we do video, we're doing video now with the How I Built This Resilience series. But in general, most of the people who consume what I make consume it through their, their ear, earbuds. And so there's a very intimate relationship that I develop with my listeners. You know, it's me talking to you. It's not me talking to a camera in a studio. Right. Right. To, you know, it's, it's a very different way of communicating. If I'm in a, on a camera, I'm talking to hello America, you know, it's a different, it's, it's, a, it's an impersonal communication. But if I'm talking, it's similar on the radio too, by the way. But if I'm talking on the show, I really am talking to one listener, even though, you know, millions are listening. And that's how I think about it. And I think that's how the listener thinks about it. And that's why I prefer it because it creates an intimacy and a real relationship between me and, and, and my listeners. I totally agree. And people, I think that's why people who are in your audience love you. They're like, oh, he's my person. Like we're, you know, we're super connected. Um, one other podcast that I love that you're doing is Wow in the World. And um, you're also a dad. And what, it, what made you want to do that? I, I don't know many podcasts that are for kids that are that beloved. And is it true that that's NPR's first ever kid podcast? Yeah, I, I, um, we, we, we produce, I have a, a kids production company called Tinkercast that I partner um, with so my sweet. friend Mindy Thomas and uh, Meredith Halpern Ranzer. And we, we launched Wow in the World um, about three years ago and we partner with NPR, they distribute it. And it is, um, you know, really started out because we are all parents. You know, Mindy is um, my co-host on that show, has a, has, has a veteran of kids media. She was on Sirius XM still is, um, has a morning show on Sirius XM called The Absolutely Mindy Show. It's wonderful. I was a fan of that show. My kids and I listened. Mindy and I became friends many, many years ago. And she used to have me come on to her show as like the serious like newsman. So I'd come on once a week and talk to kids about news. And this is like seven, eight years ago. And, you know, like five, I would say like four or five years ago, I said to Mindy, we should just do our own podcast and we can make it like an adventure. And, and, and the beauty of, of audio is your your imagination is limitless you know you can create a whole world in the kid's mind love it. without images and so we go in space we go back in time we have a flying pigeon named reggie we've got a time machine <laughs> um mindy lives in a gingerbread house i live in a micro house in the woods um you know we can do absolutely anything we want we can crash land we can um it, you know we can shrink down and go inside the human body which we, we've done all these things and um, and it doesn't require a whole lot of money. It's just a black box studio like the one I'm sitting in and um, really good sound effects and production work. So and, and that's how it began. It began as a labor of love. We wanted to make something for our kids that would be as entertaining as a video, but that wouldn't, wouldn't force them to sit in front of a screen. That's awesome. Well, 88% of this audience is female and most of them are moms. So I wanted to make sure that we mentioned it. Wow. In the um, world. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So one more question be before we're, we're going to start to wrap up, but one more question about your book is for people who love your podcast, is the book exactly like a mirror image or is there something else that they should be expecting if they go pick up the book? Yeah. I mean, the book is completely different. I mean, it's my voice. So you will, you know, as you as you read the book, you probably hear, hear me reading this to you in your head. Um, it's, you know, it's, a, it's basically a journey. It's a series of, of stories. It's, you know, told through 80 or 90 different entrepreneurs um, and their stories about the arc of, of building a business and what it takes. Um, and I very deliberately didn't, you know, didn't want this to be a replication of the podcast. I wanted it to be a completely different experience, a deeper experience. And also, I mean, even the pod, though the podcast, I think is a pretty deep experience. I wanted this to be um, deeper, um, also more, more analytical in a way and, and, and gives me a chance to offer my own observations throughout the, the book. So um, some of it is drawn from my interviews on the show and some of it is drawn from interviews that I, I did outside of the show. But here's the thing. This is kind of the open 
kind of an open secret, which is what you hear on how I built this is only about a third of the interview. Hmm. We edit it down very dramatically. So I usually interview people for about two to three hours um, because I, I need to have a fully comprehensive wow. life story interview. Um, and then we edit it down to about an hour and 15, hour and a half. So there are also things that are not on the show that don't get onto the show that are in this book. Um, but ultimately, it's really designed um, to inspire people, I hope to think about starting a business, or even if you're work, you work for a company, it's, it's designed to kind of give you a mental architecture for how to think about building something, anything, an idea to change the way you operate in your division or your department. It's designed for people who want to be, who may not want to be disruptive, but know that they have to be disruptive. Because the reality is, if you wanna change anything, if you wanna introduce something, a product or an idea out into the world, or a an idea or a product within your own company, there's going to be friction. There is no way around it. It's simple. It's as simple as that. There's going to be friction and you are going to create disruption. And hopefully this book will help you navigate how to do that without too much stress. There's going to be a little stress, but, but not too much. 100%. We've had, we've had so many people on who talk about their book, but with, and I've never said this before, my audience knows that every one of my audience needs this book. Like it, this is exactly what we need. I, I said right before we started recording, um, your podcast was the reason I, I was even interested in podcasts to begin with. It's so inspiring. It's so remarkable. And um, you inspired me to even do the work that I'm doing. And every one of you needs this book. Um, I feel like one of the biggest challenges that my audience has um, is they just feel like there's no room for them. Like, you know, I want to be a disruptor. I, I have an idea, but someone else beat me to it. There's nothing that hasn't been done. There's enough ice cream stores. There's enough electronic stuff. There's enough shoe companies. There's enough blogs. There's enough podcasts. Like who, why would I do it? Like, I don't think people feel there's room for them. What do you say to that? I mean, I, I totally understand that impulse. I mean, I, I feel that sometimes about things. The reality is, um, Every single idea out there is built upon another idea. And I don't, think, I don't think the way to look at it is, oh, there are too many ice cream stores or there are too many you know, podcasts or there are too many uh, of this or that. I think it's more about there, what is the problem I have or what is, what is, what is you know, why isn't this thing serving me and my needs? And I bet you it's not serving other people's needs. So you might be in that ice cream store or that, millionth coffee shop and you will be waiting in line for that ice cream or that cup of coffee and you will see that something isn't working for you there something isn't quite right and you know that it's a problem that needs to be solved that's that. your business that's your business idea i love that i love that idea of looking at something and saying okay here's what i love about it but what's missing what would i do what would i add i love that uh, okay, I'm going to ask you a question as we're wrapping up that you asked your guests, which is at the end, you often say, do you think that your success is a result of your skills, talent, or luck? What do you think it is for you? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's, it's tricky because I asked this question, but not hoping for a binary answer like, oh, it's luck or it's skill. It's really designed to just get people to reflect. You know, I've talked to them at this point for a long time, and I, it's like when you walk through a museum, you know, there's like the atrium in the museum, it's really big and, 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 and sort of beaming and, and it's designed that way. They, museums want you to use that space to reflect on the art you've seen. And mm. that, that question is kind of designed to do the same thing. And I, I think in my case, look, I cannot deny that, um, you know, a lot of, of what I do and what have I've been able to do um, has to do with um, privileges that I think we're, we're now having a, a really much more serious conversation in this country about um, and starting to face, um, face that, that realization. And we have to, because it's the only way to understand why um, some people do certain things and other people have been shut out from certain things. Um, and so first and foremost, I have privileges simply because I can walk into a store and, you know, I'm not viewed with suspicion or, um, you know, I got an internship at NPR and, and I was able to find mentors and, um, you know, that didn't happen just because I worked hard. 
or because um, uh, I, I had some intelligence. That also happened because of the way the world is structured and our society is structured. And I, I really believe that we have to, and hopefully will, begin to radically rethink and reshape the way we um, create opportunities for people. I do also believe in luck. Um, and for me, it's, you know, I, I, I don't think I would be able to do much of what I do or have many of the ideas I have without my wife, who's my best friend and my partner. And I met her by luck. I mean, I, I, I was a month away from moving to Germany. I went to a barbecue in Washington, DC at the last minute. I saw her there. I didn't talk to her cause I was too nervous. I called my friend and um, she went down the list of everyone who was at the barbecue until she finally realized I was talking about Hannah and, um, and didn't really know Hannah, my friend, but she, I, I asked her if she could get Hannah to another party the following weekend. And we, we started to date and, and I left three weeks later to move to Germany to be NPR's correspondent. We were away for two years. That was 20 years ago. And, and that was luck. That, that, that was luck. Can't, I can't deny it. I love that you hung out with everybody from Al Gore to Howard Schultz, we mentioned, Mark Zuckerberg, but like the only time you've mentioned being nervous is her. It's awesome. Yep. So awesome. Um, <laughs> you are such a delight. Tell us um, where we can find the book. It's coming out very yep. soon. Yep. Where we can find your podcasts with an S. Tell yep. us where we can find you and just be a part of your life. Well, you can find everything you need about the book. Sorry, it's shiny there, the how I built this book. Um, wherever you buy books, um, Amazon, wherever, but you can also go to guyraz.com, which is G-U-I-R-A-Z.com. And you can order the book there. And if you order it before the end of September, I will send you a free signed book plate that you can put in the book. So um, go check that out. And um, you can find my podcasts, How I Built This, um, wherever you get podcasts, or Wow in the World, wherever you get podcasts. And... Another show I do on leadership called Wisdom from the Top, which is available from Luminary. So that's basically me. Well, this is why you don't sleep because you <laughs> are doing so much that there, I don't even know how you would sleep. I honestly <laughs> don't know if you have nine days in a week and we all have seven, but you do it all so well. You make it seem so easy and you're such a great involved dad and you just gave such a beautiful shout out to your wife. Clearly that's working too. So I got so much out of this conversation. I'm going to go quickly take notes because I want to remember all the things that you just said that made such an imprint. Thank you so much for being here. You're Thank awesome. You. Thank 